My name is Mel Underbaki. I am the director of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, which is also known as National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms. Uh, I'm going to tell you just uh, take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about what we do. Uh, we do two things, or two major things that we do is we have a family conference for people who have a family member who is a political prisoner in the United States that have not committed the crime, but they are a political prisoner in the war on terror. And we have a Hispanic conference once a year, and it's uh, really important to family members because they've usually, well, usually been feeling very isolated. They come to this conference and they see they're not the only ones, and they can uh, talk to make friends that were in the same situation that they are in. And the other thing that we're in the midst of right now is raising money to give a gift of $100 to all of these Muslim political prisoners who are unjustly in prison, away from their families. And Ramadan is coming in about a week and a half. So I hope you come down to our uh, table downstairs. <laughs> We have a, this is a little bit of a preview, but if you come to the session tomorrow, you will hear more about this report, Inventing Terrorists. And this is available at our table for, you know, the, the donation. And you also, to, right now, you're going to hear about, well, I'll let them in a so. <laughs> But we have some information about an entrapment bill that our legal people have drafted. So I'm really happy to have with us uh, one of my really good friends, Leila Valerian, who I've known for years now, and we know each other from Tampa, Florida, when we uh, were uh, started Friends of Human Rights for her father, who was a, a, an early political prisoner, Samuel Valerian. And Leila is uh, she's a journalist and, uh, and a filmmaker, and she gets a lot of awards. She's gotten Peabody's and she just recently got a Grammy. So we are very, very proud and very happy that she's here. And I'm going to turn it over to her now and she's going to introduce the rest of our panelists. Thank you, Mel, for that lovely introduction. Thank you all for being here. Um, please text and call your friends and family who are currently at the convention and encourage them to come to this panel because this panel is about really high stakes. We're talking about people who've been entrapped, who've been unjustly targeted, and who are now in some cases spending the rest of their lives in prison due to unjust policies that target Muslims in this country. So. I have to say, for those of you who are here, thank you, and please encourage others to attend as well. Thank you also to our speakers, some of whom uh, who came in from out of town. Um, you know, thank you to uh, especially, well, thank you to all of them, but Steve and Morteza both came from New York, um, so we appreciate them making the effort to come here to speak to you about these really important issues. Now, when we watch the news and we hear about stories of terrorism cases that have been busted and, and you know, conspiracies that have been busted, oftentimes you sort of read them at face value and you think, wow, the FBI really, you know, broke up a serious plot and they're keeping us safe. But as we've come to, to know very well over the last decade and a half, these cases are, are more often than not, if not 90% of the time, completely invented by the FBI, by authorities that have targeted the Muslim community since 9-11. They are conceived by FBI agents, they are invented, they are funded, they are encouraged. People who are often very vulnerable are targeted as parts of these entrapment plots. And that's what we're here to discuss today. We're here to talk about entrapment, what the issue is, and what can be done about it. And um, we'll also hear from somebody's personal experience as a so-called war on terror uh, detainee. So I wanted to, to start out by introducing our panelists. Each of them will speak for 20 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, and we're going to start out with somebody 
who is immediately to my left, Sabri bin Kahna, is a theologian, lecturer of Islamic studies, and civil rights advocate, as well as a former prisoner. He graduated with honors from George Mason University in international studies and comparative religion. He studied all over the Middle East, including Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. And uh, some of his studies include Arabic, Quranic, and Islamic studies. Uh, but the best education he had was from the School of Hard Knocks, um, where he's learned some of life's greatest lessons. I assume uh, that includes his uh, time that he spent in prison, uh, which I'm sure he'll talk about. Uh, Sabri's goal is to spread beneficial knowledge and strive to protect and encourage civil liberties for everyone, especially the oppressed. Uh, please join me in welcoming Sabri Vikram. Basically, I was put into a secret prison, and 
captured it, drove by with a blindfold and shackled, uh, transported to a um, secret prison. And I kept, I was kept there, you know, in two different prisons underground, basically for almost two to three months. And I had no idea why the whole time. Um, right at the end, uh, the consulate came to tell me, you know, my parents in the meantime were obviously very worried. The, the family, the then bride, uh, called my family and said, "What happened? You know, to your son? He didn't show up." And they started getting frantic and looking for me. And finally, through a lot of pressure, it came out that I was being held at the request of the FBI. Um, after that, I was transported on a uh, tarmac of an airport to a private plane filled with FBI agents. I thought things would be getting better because I'd be under American custody, but it actually got worse. Um, they treated us very bad. There were some other American citizens as well that were questioning me, along with me that I didn't know about until after we came to America. That's how secretive it was. Um, they, you know, basically stripped us, uh, took photos of us in the nude, uh, put us into orange jumpsuits, uh, shackled us, blindfolded us, threatened us with uh, transfer to Guantanamo. Um, all, you know, which you'll find out later for nothing. So at the end, I'm, I'm skipping through a lot of detail, but I was put into a uh, prison in Virginia and under very harsh circumstances, like I've never committed a crime in my life, I've never had any, you know, relationship with the law or being in prison or having even a ticket at that time. So it was just, you know, all kind of overwhelming like, to take this in. And, you know, they put me in like a filthy, very disgusting cell uh, with, at that time, a holding cell with a person that was like, you know, sick and coughing and some common criminal, I had no idea. After that, they put me into a solitary confinement. Um, and then they transported to a place called Orange County. In Orange County, I was, we have breakfast at like 4.30 in the morning. Uh, I forget what time lunch, but dinner is like at 4.30 in the afternoon. And then you don't have no food until the next, you know, morning, so you get very hungry. And they keep it cold in there. Um, they, like, like I said, I didn't know the system. I didn't know my rights or anything like that. I was just basically going along with the flow. Um, you're supposed to get an hour of break a couple of times a week. And <clears throat> the guy would come, you know, at 2.30 or 3 in the morning and knock on the door and, and say, do you want to go out for a rep? You know? And I didn't know. Like, I would be like, I'm sleeping. You know, leave me alone. And so I found out later he was writing, I was dying rep, you know, the whole time. And uh, it was not much for rep anyways, because you go out and shack with me. Uh, one hand loose, you know, chains on my feet, the other hand tied, and they give you a basketball, and that's your rep. So you can just shoot with one hand for your rep. Um, uh, regardless, the, the conditions were very disgusting and miserable. I didn't know my rights. Uh, alhamdulillah, I was bonded out and put under home confinement. Um, about a year after March 2004, I was acquitted of all charges. Uh, Fiona break them up, she actually, you know, said that the uncontested evidence uh, was that there has not been a, uh, or that an American defendant was never treated like so badly, basically, and I was held like in a cop is type situation, and uh, she acquitted me, you know, of all charges. So all that I went through, and I was acquitted, they had no proof whatsoever. They had some statements of, you know, people but no evidence on me, and they put me through all of that. I was acquitted, and I thought I could get on with my life, but shortly thereafter, I was subpoenaed to a grand jury, and, uh, you know, a couple of grand juries, actually. They raided my home, they raided my father's business, they raided my brother's uh, fiance's home, and her mother actually worked for the FBI. Uh, and it was just, you know, constant harassment. I tried to get on, you know, I would slow down after a while. I had built the program at Johns Hopkins to get my master's, at the uh, School of Advanced International Studies. And uh, as I was going there, I went to, I was selected to lead a group of students to the Middle East for an all expense paid trip to the Middle East um, for you know educational and business purposes. And as I was in the airport, I was stopped by the FBI and said that I could not leave. Um, so you know, the nightmare didn't stop. So they stopped me, you know, they didn't let me get on the flight, I missed that trip. And then about a week after I was indicted on uh, perjury and obstruction, uh, obstruction of justice. This is called the perjury trap. Basically, um, they, they bring you in, they know whatever they, uh, 
all the information already, and then just try to trip you up so you can say something wrong, and then try to try to encourage you. It's been used with lots of advice activists in the past. Um, I was, you know, they would ask me questions from like 1999 or, or years prior about phone numbers about people, and I had no idea what they were talking about. And like the reason I was telling you earlier how I was so, uh, you know, multicultural basically is because that's how my nature is. So even like going, I met people from all walks of life, all types of, of people throughout my, you know, studying abroad. So maybe I met people that were good people. I don't know. I couldn't keep. I wasn't like an FBI or CIA agent to keep up with every single person I met. So allegedly, I, you know, they asked me a lot of the questions that I was already acquitted of, and they said I was lying, and then they charged me with uh, obstruction of justice and perjury. I went to trial, and unfortunately, this time I was not successful, and they, uh, you know, sentenced me to ten years. I just want to read a quick um, letter or two. If you can try to time. So this was from the Congressman Jim, Jim Moran. He served our district for over 20 years. He said, I have known the Mikala family for close to 20 years. They are a decent, hardworking, and patriotic family. They are good citizens who care about this country, admire and constructively participate in the political process. Mr. Mikala has been very engaged in civic activity since he was a young man at Jim Stewart High School. I remember him inviting me to speak in front of the advanced placement history class. He was one of the only high school uh, students chosen to be both representative to Boy State and the World Affairs Conference. Always active in local politics, Mr. McCullough worked on local campaigns and also served as an election officer. He believed everyone had a civic duty to vote and spent considerable energy educating others on their voting rights. Mr. Gra uh, McCullough graduated with honors from George Mason at the age of 21 in conjunction with the pursuit of graduate degrees from Johns Hopkins. School of Advanced International Studies. He went abroad to strengthen the knowledge of Islam and Arabic. And he goes on, but you get the point. And this is from a congressman who served over 20 years, and he knew me personally for all that time. The next quote I'm going to read to you. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, Sabri bin Khalid is not a terrorist. He does not have the same characteristic of a terrorist. And uh, does not share the same uh, characteristic conduct of terrorists, and it does not turn to the, uh, does not share the likelihood of cynicism, the, the difficulty of rehabilitation, or the need of incapacitation. The defendant has not committed any other criminal acts, so there's no reason to believe he would ever commit another crime after his release from imprisonment. The defendant has engaged in model citizenry, receiving a master's degree from Johns Hopkins University. I didn't get to complete that, so that's not technically correct. Uh, volunteering as a national elections officer in local, state, and national elections. It is clear that in the case of this instant defendant, like, uh, it's likely of ever committing another crime is infinitesimal. In fact, the court received more letters on Sabri's behalf than any other defendant in 25 years, all attesting to his honor, integrity, moral character, and opposition to extremism. So, this is from the sentencing judge. He said this. It's proof from his own tongue that I was you know, engaged in civic uh, duties. Model citizens on the street, uh, serving the community, dedication to my son. You can go, there's a lot, a lot more I didn't read, I just want to summarize it. But then he sent his speech to 10 years in prison after that. And I'm not trying to brag about who I was or what I did, but I just want to get you a point across that I was you know, a normal American citizen growing up in this country, actually being a more productive citizen in terms of getting people to vote and be educated about their civic duties. right? And this is what he gave me. And he said I was not a terrorist, I had no connection to terrorism, I had no chance of recidivism, recidivism. Um, and yet he still sentenced me to 10 years with a terrorist enhancement. And I got lucky. Unfortunately, 10 years is nothing compared to what some of our brothers and sisters are going through right now. There are life sentences being uh, applied to people just like me. Another case I want to talk about is Nick Young. You know, like me, he grew up in this area. Um, and he was a, a very good student as well. He never got in trouble. In fact, he became a uh, DC Transit Metro Police Officer. And they have jurisdiction over the Tri-State. Right. In fact, he got a set. He served as a veteran officer for over 13 years without once having to use his gun or his taser or even lifting his hand towards anybody. In fact, he got a citation from the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. 
a combination. You know, because he stopped a criminal that was waving a knife, a robber, who had a prior conviction without using any force whatsoever. Uh, they approached him to be an informant, an FBI agent, actually, first of all. He did not want to do that type of work. So then they started sending informants to him over a six year period, trying to get him to commit the crime and trap him. But he refused. At the end, finally, because of his heart, because of him caring about another Muslim, a so-called Muslim, who was actually an FBI informant, sending him a $250 gift card, and he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. This is a police officer, a white American, who never had a crime in his life, and he's sentenced to 15 years in prison. For nothing. He would never have ever thought of supporting terrorism. And yet this person that he took in, that he tried to help, he felt sorry for him. You know, and this guy kept bugging him and bugging him and bugging him and eventually he gave him a $250 gift card or Google phone card or something like that so he can call his family. And they said he's supporting ISIS. And he gets 15 years in prison. And I can go on and on about the many different cases. Some people are doing life sentence for a speech. No action whatsoever. <clears throat> it's very scary and we have to wake up. Right now there's over 240 uh, political prisoners, Muslim political prisoners. And if we don't wake up, it's going to keep happening. You know, my case was over a while ago. Well, look, it just happened again to me. It's happening again and again, especially with people who are, sometimes they target people that are like mentally unstable, you know, or they go to the youth and encourage them and hike them up and put a crime in their head that they never have attended to, to commit before, you know, and then get them convicted for that. It's disgusting. So we as Muslims have to stand up for justice and do our best to educate ourselves and our community about our rights, about being careful to fall in these traps, and to support a bill that Brother Steve is going to talk about in a minute or two, uh, a bill that he's working on that kind of protects us against this type of entrapment. Allah SWT says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُنُوا الْقَوَّمِينَ بِالْقِسْتِ شُهَدَاءِ لِلَّهِ وَلَوْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ وَالْوَالِمِينَ وَالْأَقْرَدُونَ فِي يَكُنْ غَنِيًا أَوْ فَقِيرًا فَاللَّهُ أُولَىٰ بِهِمَا that Allah is encouraging or ordering us to establish justice. Right? A Muslim, he is just, he stands for justice, he fights for justice. In fact, there's some ayat in the Quran, I'm not going to go into detail because there's not enough time, but we are ordered to, uh, to act upon justice. And in fact, some of the religions said that the purpose of the prophets being sent to mankind is to establish justice. So we as Muslims must support, when we see a just cause, we have to support it with Muslims or even non-Muslims. We stand for justice. We stand for truth. We cannot stand by idly while our brothers and sisters are being oppressed. We don't stand for oppression anywhere. So I encourage you, inshallah, to support this bill that you're going to talk about. And also, if you can spread the word about this organization, it's a small organization, but they are doing a lot of work. They're doing work that all these major national organizations are not doing. All these years that we've had, you know, and I was an intern for, I was the first intern for CARE, actually, I have bragging rights for that, CARE, the Council of you know, American Islamic Relations. So, you know, all the years it's been in existence, and I love them, the brother we had and the others, I, I, I've known them since I was a kid, but they haven't done legislation yet, and that's like a no-brainer. We need to pass legislation, that's how you get in power, that's how you can stop these types of crimes. Also, one more thing, um, we have the Ramadan program, which is you give a hundred dollars, you know, donate a hundred dollars, and it will be sponsored. You will sponsor it in the month of Ramadan. With that hundred dollars, you can buy commissary, have some type of extra food, you know, when you wake up for suhoor or something like that. And just the gesture of the gift that somebody is actually caring for you is a beautiful gesture. You know, I used to receive it when I was on the inside, and it meant a lot to me. You know, somebody that I didn't know was sending me a hundred dollars as a gift. It's something that we can. <coughs> You know, just like a couple cup of <coughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Just like a couple cup of you know coffee, you can sacrifice it for a couple of weeks. That's like a hundred dollars that you can spare, inshallah. And it does make a difference. So, Zakhmah Khair for coming. I hope you spread the word, inshallah. Zakhmah Khair, Islam. Thank you so much, Sabri, for those beautiful.
beautiful words and for telling your story in such a heartfelt way. I know it takes a lot of strength to get up here, especially when you've been through everything you've been through, to really open up to this audience and to tell your story. We're so grateful for that. Um, as, as Brother Sophie said, by the way, I should mention, when, when I was um, a speaker on my father's case, um, you know, he, he's, he was deported basically in 2015. So it's been several years since I've had to really go out and advocate. But at the height of our activism on this case, and if you don't know this case, his name is Dr. Sangat Adyan. He was a political prisoner here in the U.S. after 9-11. And uh, he was detained basically from 2003 until uh, 2015, in one way or another, uh, when he was finally deported. But there was a there was a period of time after he was acquitted in his trial in Florida, and um, when the government was trying to do to him what they did to Brother Sabri here, which is essentially a perjury trial. You win your case, which Brother Sabri did, and they try to get you another way. This is a blatant abuse of power. At a time when we hear the Trump administration talking about the deep state and abuse of power, it's important to know that this is something Muslims have been warning against since 9-11. The fact that there are two systems of justice, and that Muslims you know, face things in the justice system that others would never have to face. One of those is, is a tactic that has been used against other minorities, other civil rights leaders, a way to basically um, get you when, when they didn't succeed, and that's to bring you before a grand jury, have you testify, and then you could say where you were born, and, and, they could, and, and you could misspeak, and, and they would say that you committed perjury, you lied, it doesn't matter really what, what you say, that's the point. Um, and, and the standard for perjury is so low, so I remember those days when I would say your name so much, and, sort of a companion case to what was happening to my father. Um, as Brother Sully said, there is an Ramadan program. I just want to make one more plug for that. Um, get on your phones, go on the website, civilfreedoms.org. You can donate very easily uh, through PayPal. You can also go to the bazaar and make a donation there. Um, At the bazaar, one level down. It's one level down. Oh, sorry, they're not in the bazaar. They have a table one level down. Sorry, I misspoke. Find the Civil Freedoms table, the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. Make a donation. It makes such a difference um, to these men who feel forgotten. We are so honored to have journalist Murtaza Hussein join us here. Um, if you don't already know his name, you should. He writes for The Intercept. He's been writing about civil liberties and national security, foreign policy, and human rights for years. Um, he's a very cogent, powerful voice on these issues. Um, he also covers domestic terrorism prosecutions in the U.S., including wrongful convictions, and the subject we're here to talk about today, FBI entrapment cases. He's reported from Bosnia, Turkey, Jordan, and France. His work has previously been featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, and Al Jazeera English. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hussein. Hello, Tom. Uh, thank you so much, Devin, for coming to our event. Uh, that's uh, this case. Uh, unfortunately, there's hundreds that have been said. And uh, so much of it is not part of public knowledge. It's not part of uh, what we talk about. We talk about the real abuses of power in the United States. But I'm so glad that we shared it. And thank you, and thank you all of you who came out today. It's uh, not a huge crowd as I was thinking, but it's a, it's a more intimate crowd, more motivated. So thank you guys all be here for a reason. Uh, so as Dana mentioned, I've been working as a journalist for many years, specifically over many of those years, focused on cases like Saudis, people who were targeted for terrorism charges in the United States post 9-11. And I think it would be helpful to give people here who may not be familiar with the background of how these cases started, the political context, uh, a framing of you know, where we are and how we got to this point. I think there were two phases of law enforcement scrutiny of Muslims in the United States uh, beginning after 9 11. And the first phase was very distinct because it really targeted the leaders of the Muslim community in the sense of people.
people who were businessmen, uh, the head of civil society organizations, academics, well as father. Uh, and we saw crackdowns on major Muslim organizations, uh, the most famous, of course, the Holy Land Foundation, which at the time was the biggest Muslim charity in the United States. There was lots of Indian Care and many other Muslim organizations. And they really created an environment of fear and uh, dread of what was going to happen. Many people who were extremely educated people, people who were leaders in their community in the sense of philanthropy and uh, raising the youth, they are doing decades in jail, life sentences, in extremely harsh circumstances. People who are fathers and grandfathers, uh, the ones who you look up to as models in any community, those people at 9 11, they were targeted in a way which uh, was so egregious and they continued language in jail and without much notice or attention from the government or those in the government some power. They were educated, successful professionals to rely on. And it found that in the first five years after 9 11, they had been something of a decapitation of the Muslim community in the sense that the ones that they would rely on for protection or to lobby or to pass laws or to protect people who were more vulnerable were either incarcerated themselves in grave legal jeopardy or had been bullied and intimidated to the point where it was unable or very difficult to operate. But as it turns out, and something that came to light many years later, this actually was not about 9 11, it predated 9 11. There had been, since the 80s, a nationwide program by the FBI called Vulgar Betrayal. That was a code name of the program. And it was essentially a surveillance program of Muslims and Muslim organizations all over the United States. This was electronic surveillance, physical surveillance, the use of performance. The government basically built files on any active Muslim in public life in the United States. And through years and years of investigation, likely millions of dollars spent, tens of thousands of hours of manpower, this investigation did not result in a single criminal charge. No, there was no uncovering of terrorism networks, no uncovering of criminality. I think one of the only charges that came to light was mail fraud or something by some organization. Uh, there wasn't much. After 9-11, these investigations were turned on and looked at in a new purpose. And one thing, a very common thing that you find in FBI's community and the Muslim community is that even before 9-11, it was very focused on pro-Palestinian activism in the United States. And those activists were tarred with association with 9-11, though in a sober reading of these uh, circumstances, they had nothing to do with that. Even the Holy Land Foundation case, it was a very fervent atmosphere in the United States. Uh, there was a lot of fear, and in that case, they were allowed to be connected to the public mind through these horrible attacks that happened in D.C. and New York. Though in reality, their case had to do with a resistance movement or a militant movement, accusations supporting it in Palestine. There was no connection. But by, by 2006, 2007, I would say that uh, the Muslim community had been very, very or how by these legal tactics. This is the second phase of the law enforcement scrutiny of Muslims in the United States, targeting quote unquote ordinary people. And these are people who are oftentimes young men, working class backgrounds, not educated professionals, sometimes people who had histories of run ins with the law, but things that have to do with terrorism, uh, histories of delinquency, maybe drug problems many, many people who had mental illness, and they became the raw material to continue the perception that terrorism was ubiquitous in the United States. So you saw the rise of these entrapping cases, and I would really call them manufacturing cases of uh, terrorism in the U.S., where young men, uh, as Sarvi alluded to in his comments, would be approached by people they thought they were their friends or prospective friends, or thought they were maybe advisors, older people in the community, who befriended them, put ideas in their mind about you know, committing violent acts, uh, or even suggesting that maybe something was good to be done, uh, and sort of egging them along. And as we know, uh, young people especially, they're very impressionable. And when 
they are befriended by an older person who is very motivated, uh, they can be coerced or persuaded to say things, not even doing anything, but saying things or agreeing with things, which if played back in a court recording could look very incriminating to the jury, which is already looking at the situation with their own biases and uh, preconceptions. So there were hundreds of people who ended up targeted by FBI and traffic stamps. People who I would say had no desire or no capacity to commit any violent act, but are now languishing in jail for decades, sometimes with life sentences. There's one case in particular that I want to talk about which is very close to my heart. Not because it is necessarily the most egregious case, but I think because I think it's emblematic of how unjust this practice is and how useless it is to security the United States as well. It's putting people in jail who really are models for success in immigration in the United States, in my opinion. Uh, there were a group of guys in 2008 in New Jersey, in uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, who were accused of planning an attack on a military base. And they were, four of them were immigrants from Albania, one was a Palestinian background, and they had peed the delivery business and the accusation against them, which I remember at the time, and I remember finding it odd in 2008 that they were delivering pizzas and they were planning to attack the military base and deliver pizzas to New Jersey. And like a lot of cases, and I noticed before I became a journalist, the vast majority of terrorism reporting in the United, United States is our news outlets which rewrite the government press release in sort of, you know, a little bit different language here and there. But the overall majority of it is very uncritical acceptance of the government narrative. And when it flashes across our news screens, you know, we see, you know, oh, it looks like another case was uncovered and thankfully they caught these terrorists again. But when you unpack not even the narrative of defense, the government's narrative and their court documents, it's a very different picture of news. So, in the Fortex case, there were three young men we focused on our reporting, the Duca brothers, Shane, El Jr., and, uh, right. and they essentially, they were accused of taking part in a plot in which they actually had no idea of the, the plot that existed. And the case was so egregious that at the sentencing, the judge, who clearly was motivated to give them a harsh sentence, and partly this is due to political surrounding this case because the Attorney General at the time was Julian Chris Christie, and he had made this a very key touchstone in his legal career. The judge said, Well, you know, there is not much evidence in this case of your involvement in this plot, but it didn't bother the jury, so it shouldn't bother me either. Four sending them to life in prison. Can you imagine this is somebody's life? They're being told there's not any evidence, but you know, too bad. So we did a very intensive investigation in this case. They had no idea that the plot, they were not involved in it. And we spoke to the informant in the case as well, which is very rare, because there one estimation or one FBI report, I think the number has probably gone up by now. We don't have updated figures because they don't make this number readily known. There are about 15,000 FBI informants actually dealt with that. So these are people all over the place, all over Muslim communities, you know, schools, events. Uh, as we know from the Vulgar Betrayal documents, they attend Muslim gatherings, maybe some heirs are born, and so forth. <laughs> uh, but we spoke to the in this case, and we told him, he talked to us, he said, Look, I told my handler that don't get the idea, these guys are not terrorists, they don't know anything about this plot. And they said, hey, don't worry about it. Just keep talking to them. Don't worry about that. It doesn't matter if you're not nervous. We'll take care of it. <coughs> 10 months pass, 11 months pass. The brothers thought this was their friend. He was hanging out with them. They were going out hanging out all the time. They were going on vacations together. They were not pizza together. And the informant is telling his handlers, hey, I don't know why I'm still doing here. There's no terrorists going on in here. Why are we still investigating this? And so just don't worry about it. Okay. It took 18 months until they finally wrapped up the case, and they felt that they had enough recordings of people either not objecting to someone else talking about terrorism or 
laughing about something, to stitch together to make a case which in a highly biased court environment would be enough to convict somebody of terrorism. And you know, the judge in some sense that didn't find it was compelling, but it was just a bunch of Muslim guys in New Jersey, immigrants from James. That was essentially the message they were saying. And they're languishing in prison in the most horrible circumstances I can imagine. They're in prison in the United States, which is awful in general. They are in supermax, solitary confinement. Uh, and anyone who spent time in jail or visited jail or understands what that means knows that that's no life at all. So, you know, that was, as I said, the second phase of this, uh, the FBI's relationship with Muslims in the United States. And I think that we entered a new dynamic in 2014 as well, uh, which was corresponding with the rise of this group ISIS. If you look at the practices of that group or their strategy, I, I don't accept the framing that there is a very powerful threat in the United States or I think that there are nuisances and very violent and uh, deadly nuisances should be addressed in some appropriate law enforcement tactic. But they're not compelling. They don't, they don't, it's not the, like, the way it was discussed in the media was very hyperbolic. It's not a mass movement such as mass movements that exist in history, including the Muslim world. They were not like uh, Nikki Jamaat or communists or something like that. Whole sector and class of society are attracted to them. People are attracted to these groups are very, the people who are on the margins of our communities, people who are highly susceptible to uh, suggestions. They're people who have very disproportionate histories of mental illness and drug use. And several hundred of these people were accused of being ISIS supporters in the United States. And I saw even more so than the first phase, which of course targeted professionals, which was very political. Second phase, which targeted people who were working class, you know, I would say ordinary. People accused of being ISIS members in the United States were people in many cases who had extreme mental illness. I document one case in Arizona of a 17 year old. His IQ was maybe in the 60s, and if you know what that means, he's, his motor skills were very poor. He couldn't tie his own shoes. His parents didn't let him have a driver's license. They didn't let him have a cell phone because they didn't trust him. Well, as it turned out, the FBI informant who secretly confronted him said, Hey, don't worry, your parents are still giving yourself one way. Here's a cell phone, let's keep talking. And the FBI had been in touch with this kid, uh, part of the time when I that now, since he was 14, because his teachers and his parents had made them aware that, hey, you know, he's not functioning very well. And somehow the FBI got involved, and the FBI visited him for years and years, and then went home. And the family, as many people tend to do, they Trusted law enforcement and the government as their friends. They said that, you know, their FBI is here to help our son. So get to know him over the years, you know, whatever. Make this report. Hopefully it'll be something good for him in the long term. Two weeks after his 18th birthday, they arrested him for supporting the Taliban in the United States. And lo and behold, the people who'd been there to help him had been building a case against him in the living room of his parents' home. And how cruel is that? How awful to wait two weeks after his 18th birthday to accuse him of all these types of things. We did some reporting about it, and one thing that I think is very important to remember is that people in law enforcement, they are people, in the sense that they are susceptible to the same shaming or criticism that any of us do in our jobs. And in the end, that young man got about five years in jail. And I think that's five years too many for what he was accused of and the circumstances and what happened. But I do believe that the media coverage of the case, which was very shaming, made it very seem like it was a police state operating, it's uh, very young and uh, incapable of man, has an effect. Of course, it's possible to prove that, but I do think, I say that to encourage people to talk to journalists who trust, to talk to people who connect with them, because it does make a difference. And including telling stories of people who have suffered in the past, it builds up the historical record of what happened in this moment so that future generations can look back and say, hey, an injustice did happen. Because if we don't document it, there's no proof it happened. We can say it never happened. We waged a very successful war against terrorism. We got 200 terrorists off the street who would have been 
uh, dangerous than threatening the United States. But even in retrospect, we can say that this was an injustice. It can be something which is looked back upon as previous uh, episodes of injustice in the United States. It can better the next generation. It can hopefully win some restitution for those who suffer now. And it can stand as a milestone in the history of our presence in the United States. The last thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, what happened after 9 11, which continues to happen in the Muslim United States, is part of a broader context. Uh, there, the United States government, FBI, they had a case to solve that suicide after the attacks in the decades after. And when you have a problem, you know, you have a toolkit which you already are very used to. So, these entrapment and informant tactics they were used previously in the Black and Latino communities in the United States. Uh, there is a paradigm that exists previously of mass incarceration that they used to address certain issues that they feel only addressing. And when they needed to address the issue of the Muslim community, they looked at their pre existing paradigms. So they said, let's use mass incarceration to deal with this issue. There's a 17 year old mentally ill. And he's communicating with our informants, and he seems to like the Taliban. You know, there's many we talk to his parents about it, we can talk to the teachers, we can maybe get a mental health, or we can look at we already have many prisons, we already have many easily approachable laws to use this. Let's we take the easiest path and put them in jail. If there's somebody who, you know, we just don't like, we consider them undesirable, we have many empty prisons, let's just fill them up. No one will care the game. They maybe don't have the ability to articulate themselves in the networks to, uh, or the knowledge even about their rights, which I was not aware of my rights either, because until you're in jail in that position, or seeing people in that position, you don't feel that that's something you can worry about. So many people end up having their rights trampled because they're not aware of, uh, they never prepared for that situation. So the mass incarceration paradigm is very much focused on this in the United States and has been for some time. I think that uh, there is a lull in the last year or so, even just less than a dozen of these cases. After a high of maybe, maybe 100 a year in 2014 onwards, but it's not gonna, it's not over. There will be another episode, there will be another, uh, you know, God forbid, some political episode or violent episode which makes this happen again. When that does, we need to be prepared. There's no rights to have like that works in place to support civil rights, uh, journalism, and other things. And for those of you who came out today, please spread the word and uh, thank you for being motivated and caring about this and caring about the political prisoners that continue to languish in jail uh, across this country today. Thank you so much, um, Tessa, for that really informative uh, history and background on how these cases have come to be. I'd like to introduce Steve Downs. Steve Downs graduated from Amherst College and Cornell Law School after serving in the Peace Corps in India. He was chief attorney of the New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct from 1974 to 2003, and he was also part of the defense team in U.S. versus Yassin Adif. And a, and a founder of Project Saddam, which was founded in 2008. He was also the executive director of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, formerly the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms, from 2012 to 2013. And he's currently the chair of the CCF board. Please join me in welcoming Steve Downs. Thank you all. Well, see, this is the problem of coming number three after two very articulate speakers. You, you took all my material, I have nothing left to talk about. Um, but these are truly tragic cases, and I think it's all of us come to this subject unwillingly because we know people. Uh, Sabri was one of my heroes. I, I ran into his case many, many years ago, 2006. I never knew the guy, I didn't know who he was. But his case absolutely ca captivated me. The guy that went through all of the stuff that these people were going through and was found innocent. And then the government went after him again and put him in a perjury trap. I couldn't believe it. And it was, one of the, it was when I began to realize the relentlessness 
of what the government was about. <clears throat> um, so let me just talk a little bit about how I got into this initially. Uh, my colleague down here, Kathy Manley, and I, in 2006, were, uh, became part of a defense of a uh, local imam, you see in Arab, which has been referenced here. Um, and at the end of the trial, um, I became very uh, close to Yassine. I, he was a wonderful, brilliant man, uh, very compassionate man. He was absolutely not a terrorist. The government's case was complete nonsense. There was absolutely no evidence that this guy was a terrorist. Um, and at the end of the trial, he was convicted and uh, given a 15-year sentence. And I think Kathy and I were both crushed. We couldn't understand how this possibly could have occurred. And there was a news conference that happened right after the trial. And at the news conference, there was so little evidence that this guy was a terrorist, and the case made so little sense that a reporter asked the chief prosecutor, and he said, yeah, I understand, you, you got a guilty verdict, but do you have any evidence that he was actually a terrorist? And the prosecutor was surprised, he kind of stepped back and he said, terrorist? No, we don't have any evidence that he was a terrorist. But he had the ideology. In order to preempt anything else from happening, we did this thing. Oh, and it stuck in my mind, and I began to say, he, in order to preempt anything else, this is preemptive prosecution, prosecuting somebody before they commit a crime based on, ide on their ideology. And that is the definition of a political prisoner. Uh, and that is why I think we're very uh, clear in saying, describing these prisoners as, pri as political prisoners, because they are basically people who have been prosecuted on their ideology, whatever that means. And we began to find after the scenes case, dozens and dozens and dozens of other cases, which made no sense at all when you looked at the evidence. Um, and you began to realize uh, that there was a certain pattern to it. And the pattern simply was that these people were being prosecuted because the government had some sort of a suspicion. And I think it's exactly what the, uh, Taz was saying about a toolbox. Back in the 60s, the FBI had a toolbox in which they decided to take down black extremists. And they came up with a program called COINTELPRO. And in COINTELPRO, they went around and they brought false charges against black leaders and actually did a couple of uh, assassinations, and they did a few other things that were very bad. And eventually they got called out on it. And uh, there was a congressional committee uh, went after them, and this program that was called COINTELPRO was officially shut down. As was pointed out, it probably never ended. They just dialed it back. After 9-11, the, uh, the FBI was charged the job of making sure that there was never another terrorist attack. And so they had to go around and round up terrorists before they struck. Well, how do you know who's a terrorist before they strike? You don't know. And so the, the paradigm of the government was they reached back to get the COINTELPRO um, uh, template, basically, in which you uh, try to search for people who have a potential for violence, whatever that means. I don't know how do you know what's potential for violence? But they worked in other little phrases like recently radicalized or uh, you know excessively religious, um, engaged in religious studies, all of these kinds of things. And in some sort of a paradigm or a, a algorithm that they had, they tried to figure out who might be uh, prone to violence, and then they would bring charges to lock them up and give them absurdly long sentences. And that's why they could, uh, for example, in Sabri's case, they had decided that he had the potential for violence. We don't know why, they never explained it. But after he was acquitted by the jury, they felt perfectly happy about turning right around and going back after him again in a perjury trial. And they would, if he got beaten that one, they would have gone back and done it again. And they would have kept doing it until he was locked up. The same was true with Nick Young. At one point, uh, the, the defense asked the prosecutor, how long would you, they, they 
assigned a, um, a man to follow him around, uh, an informant, to follow him around for about, was it six years? Oh, six years, becoming his best friend, uh, doing everything, becoming the greatest guy, and trying to always talk him to step over the line, just something over the line, until finally after six years, they got this guy, Nick Young, to send $200 to him, supposedly in Syria, actually, he was in the FBI headquarters, but <laughs> Young didn't know that. Um, so the, that was what he was trying to do, which is constantly trying to push him over the line. And they asked the, the prosecutor, they said, how long would you have gone after Nick Young? How long? They said, well, probably forever. He was the only Muslim police officer in D.C. And I think that put him on the list right away. And that's all you need. He had the potential for violence, as far as the FBI was concerned, in their own narrow little world in which they listen to so-called experts on Islam that are in fact often Islamophobes. Really what I think the FBI was looking for overall was information. And they've often said we need information. How are we going to get the information except that we get the guys inside? The rationale was they have a propensity for violence, but in fact, I think most of the time, or a lot of the time, they were looking for people who they thought could give them information about who might be a problem. So anyway, um, that's where the phrase preemptive prosecutors, so we don't have it here. Uh, we have been writing um, material about preemptive prosecution uh, for better on a decade now. Uh, we're following some 600 cases, uh, and these are all cases uh, that are uh, really, really desperate, I think, uh, to take the, the father, the, the son, and the family, put them in jail 15, 20, 40 for life um, for no reason. Uh, it's devastating to the families. Uh, we do family conferences. We uh, try to send, for example, money to the prisoners in jail to let them know that they have not been forgotten. I think that's very important for prisoners to know that they have not been forgotten because it looks like the entire society wants to bury them. And in fact, uh, they need to know that there is at least a group out there that understands that they're in jail not because of anything they did. It's not their fault. Um, so for years, uh, Kathy and I and, and uh, all the rest of us may started our group down here. And, uh, of course, uh, the Alarians are, are, have been champions of this. Del Underbaki has been a champion down in Florida with Fred. Uh, we have a whole group of people that have sort of got this paradigm and have been working to do something about it. Um, and in a way, I kind of got the feeling we were going around the country depressing people. You know, looking at the faces out there, I think maybe I've got depressed you now. But now we got something better. We got something better. Uh, Kathy has been working on it. We think the time is right to try to finally do something about the situation. Uh, and so we created a bill. We looked at what their, the characteristics of preemptive prosecutions. What are the things about preemptive prosecutions that seem to have in common and also that seem to be overreached by the government? And one of the things that is very characteristic about a lot of the cases, about 40% of the cases, uh, is the idea of entrapment, using FBI agents uh, to entrap people. And the way that the FBI agents tend to get onto you is, at least officially, um, by something that you said, uh, language that you used that, that either indicated violence or perhaps that you have access to the people that they want to talk to. Um, ideology. That, that is the rationale term that was presented to us in, in, in the Essenes case. Uh, and if ideology is the moving thing, ideology is protected by the First Amendment. You're allowed, allowed to have an ideology, particularly a religious ideology. That's okay. And that should not be actionable. No one should be able to go and say, I don't like your ideology, I'm going to prosecute you for it. What the FBI is doing is saying, well, all right, the Constitution prohibits us from prosecuting you for it. But what will 
will do is will assign an agent to you, and he will follow you around for years, three years, four years, five years, six years, pretending to be your best friend, carrying a tape recorder, trying to talk you into saying something that we can do something about. That's not free speech. So we're going to, part of the bill that we're putting in is we're going to say the FBI cannot do that. They cannot assign an agent to a tribal infractor unless there is proof that you are actually engaged in criminal conduct, trying to uh, construct or do something criminal. Simply having an ideology, simply having free speech uh, is not a grounds to assign an agent to a tribal infractor. Um, a second thing that we looked at were the material support for terrorism charges. Under material support for terrorism, no intent is required. You simply have to violate it. If you give money to a charity, believing that it is a legitimate charity that is helping people, and it turns out that there's something about the charity that the government doesn't like, and they say, well, the money somehow got to some people that we thought were terrorists, you could be charged with material support for terrorism. It's crazy, but for example, there was a group of peace activists in Pink, uh, out in the Midwest, and they were going abroad to deal with groups uh, that were on the designated terrorist list, like the FARC in Colombia or the Palestinian groups in Palestine. And in the course of, of meeting with them, uh, they were trying to work out peaceful solutions to the conflicts that were going on there. And the government took the position that trying to talk a designated terrorist organization into becoming a peaceful organization that didn't do terrorism, that in and of itself is material support for terrorism. That's how crazy it is. There are cases where someone came over from abroad and stayed with a person and, and during the course of that, uh, stay, used the bar, borrowed the person's phone, and made a couple of phone calls, and bought some paintballs actually, and the friend of his helped package them and put them in a box to ship them abroad. That was designated. It, it turned out that the guy had come from abroad was from an organization which later became a designated terrorist organization, and he was charged with material support for terrorism simply because he helped okay, give social hospitality to someone from abroad. So, one of the parts of our bill that we're putting together is uh, that you have to intend violence. If you don't intend violence, you cannot be charged with material support for terrorism. You can't. And the third part is that um, during a trial, and I have to say that you've seen our case is perhaps the best example of it, uh, the government has a um, a tactic in a lot of these prosecution cases of giving the trial judge secret evidence, classified evidence, indicating how, how bad they think the person is, and in our case we believe they gave false information indicating he was an Al-Qaeda bomb maker when he wasn't. Um, in any event, they do that to prejudice the judge, and as a result they get very good uh, rulings from the judge, which makes the trial fundamentally unfair. You're fighting this secret evidence that you don't know what it is. Um, it was so bad in our case that uh, when we took the uh, conviction up on appeal, uh, first we filed our brief, the government filed their brief, then the government filed a secret brief that we weren't allowed to see, then the government filed a top secret brief that even the local prosecutor wouldn't want to see. Then we went in and, and argued our case before the Second Circuit, and then we were excused, and the prosecutor had a secret argument before the Second Circuit. And surprisingly, the judges didn't agree with any of our points, although we thought they were obvious and it was a very unfair trial. Um, it creates an overwhelming appearance of uh, unfairness in the trials. So those are the three aspects of our ego bill. We call it the Entrapment and Governmental Overreach Act, Relief Act, Ego Relief. And um, this is a bill that we are putting in, and we're making each one of these provisions retroactive so that um, once it's passed, uh, anybody can call a case back into court and say, 
Now there are new standards for these terrorism cases, so the case has to be reviewed under the new standards. If there was secret evidence in your case, you should be able a chance to look at the, that secret evidence and find out what it said. If you were running for material support and you had no intention to, to uh, engage in terrorism, that should be reviewed. Uh, if you had an a, uh, informant in your case, if you were entrapped, that should be reviewed as the basis they assigned a, a major to you. So, hopefully, that would result in a lot of these cases getting out. And I, I have to tell you, I really, really want to get our prisoners out. Uh, so, what I'm hoping is, because all of you know how central, it's been pointed out repeatedly here, how central justice is in this one. If you know a situation that is unjust, we should all work to, to change that, that paradigm, to get uh, people who are being treated unjustly to, to free them and to uh, relieve their suffering. If particularly true in Islam, it's also true of Christians and Jews and everybody else. Religion essentially is based on an idea of justice. And I think this is something around which we can all unite. When you say, all right, what do you want me to do? And what I would like you to do, because I only have a, a minute here left, is to agree that you're going to do just something to try to pass this bill, which would, if it gets passed, relieve a lot of suffering among a lot of people. And by the way, this is all out of date. I, we could have a, a lot more people besides this. This was done 10 years ago, so it's very old. Um, what I'd like you to do is pick up the phone and call your local representative congressional representative. Introduce yourself, say you like the, the Ego Bill, and I will give you a flyer if you want it so that you will know what the Fleet Ego Bill is about. And talk to them, and call them back. Call them back once a month. Just keep talking to them and saying, you've got to know, you don't understand what's going on out there. You don't know how the FBI is locking up people. You don't understand the kind of injustice that we're seeing. Let me explain it to you. If all of you did that, and if everybody at this conference and this convention did that, there would be a whole shift in the way Congress looks at things. But right now, the Muslims aren't talking very much to their congressional representatives. How many people here talk to your congressional representatives? Is anybody? You do. Good. Excellent. Well, keep doing it. Do it even more. And uh, take a flyer that I'll give you about the Ego Bill, read it over, and see how this would help uh, get a lot of these folks that are in jail out of jail. And I think, does that leave a little time? Okay. Good. Thank you so much to all three panelists. Um, please join me once again in giving them a round of applause. Everyone.